Hi, Marcus Patton here. Uh, I'm here talking about my new uh, comic series, 13 Shots of Whiskey. Uh, the first story being the three deaths of Willis Waterhouse. You can find me, generally speaking, uh, uh, Twitter on NJX07. Uh, you can pick up the book uh, on my Etsy, which is Marcus Patton on my gun road. If you want to support the next books I'm doing, I'm taking donations via the Ko-fi, which is linked below, or the Patreon, which is, is a bit linked below, but it's basically Marcus Patton. So here I am on Two Geeks Talking, talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a very talented comic creator. Uh, it's the first I've seen his work, and from what I've gotten to read, I love it. I love the fact that he has a Western-themed comic. I love the fact that he has a variety of interesting characters, and I love the fact that he is from across the pond. We are joined today by the ever-talented Marcus Pattern, creator of 13 Shots of Whiskey, which is a series of comics. How are you doing today, Marcus? I'm doing all right, yourself? Doing good, doing good. For those that don't know anything about yourself, as a creative person, tell us all about yourself and, and tell us about, of course, the comics that you're creating. I'm Marcus. I write and I draw comics. I've been making comics since, well, basically since I discovered Dragon Ball Z when I was about 13. And I was doing that up until I discovered Bass. Then I stopped doing making comics to make music. Turned out people didn't want me to do that. So now I've gone back to making comics. With the pandemic and everything, basically I had a lot of time and on my side. And that's one of the things I didn't have to begin with because like, you know, work and everything kind of got in the way. But like, if not now, when? At the beginning of the pandemic when I dove head on into making comics, which I certainly got better at. You know, I did a couple of projects that didn't take off or fell through. No, I did a couple of uh, anthologies that did well, like, one of the first things I did was something called Not So Fair Fairy Tales, which I did at the beginning of the pandemic, and I've literally just got my copy of it now. Oh, just wow. how weird like pub, uh, publishing stuff with other people goes. But yeah, it's like the second or third thing I did. The fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh things I did didn't work out. Because the last thing I did before the uh, 13 Shots of Whiskey uh, was called The Gateway, which me and this uh, cat called Devin Ascot, he wrote it, I drew it, and kickstarting it. And it failed to launch. Like I'd put all this effort into making a comic that just didn't come about algorithmisms or whatever. And I was, and I had like about a month and I was feeling quite salty about it. Um, and I was like, you know what? Instead of like relying on other people to make my dreams come true, I can do it myself. The shitty thing about the Kickstarter was the fact that like I had the money to launch the book, right? So if I had just gone say, you know, fuck this and launched the book, if I had tracked, from those who backed the Kickstarter, I'd have sold about 68 copies of this book, but that would have been a success. But yep. because we went by the Kickstarter, that's a failure of a book that took me three months to draw. I mean, I still had the product itself, but it's also put me in a kind of a, a salty mood. So I was like, well, you know what? I'm full of vile anger and energy. Might as well direct it into something. Jim Rugg said that he did Octobriana in seven weeks. I thought, can I do a comic from Soup to Nuts in seven weeks? And turns out I can, I mean, nine weeks, but, you know, who's coming? I'd given myself an arbitrary deadline, which I, I work better. If I've got a deadline, it means I'm striving for something. We don't have a yeah. deadline or whatever. It's meander in a case. I'm like, well, I, you know, I didn't have any set times and stuff, so you don't do it and stuff. It's one of the reasons why I started working with other people as opposed to working with myself. Hire me to do this for you and I will do it for you. That's the reasons for making the comic. The reason why I decided to tell this story of Willis Waterhouse was because essentially I like the idea at the beginning of the book, him telling his life story. And then at the second half of the book, we find out what a lying motherfucker that he is. Like the original book was called Three Deaths of This Lying Motherfucker. And that's why I changed the title to uh, 13 Shots of Whiskey because I wanted to keep the title. Apparently no one wanted me to call my story the Three Deaths of Zion Motherfuckers, so that's why it's called The Three Deaths of Willis Waterhouse. And the anthology is called 30 Shots of Whiskey because that's a dope name. I needed to create something. I wanted to uh, experiment with the confines of comic making and storytelling, like unreliable narrator and stuff. And you know what? Something about some pompous old white guy getting shot by a minority in 2021 just seemed to appeal to me. I, 
how close did we think why? Back to the comic itself here. When it comes to your anthology itself, great title, better than the uh, Samuel L. Jackson version of what you were trying to go for originally. So I, I like what you're doing either way. But when it comes to building the world that you've you've put together with 13 Shots of Whiskey, this anthology series, how did that come about? The reason it's a Western, when I was contacting writers talk about working though um what do you fancy doing and stuff because i'm quite indecisive and i want the writer to come up with the idea so there's a working kind of thing together like i would give a, a list of things that i'm interested in like quite good at horror i'm, quite, I'm interested in sci-fi and and i've discovered i like drawing horses so i was like well i want to do westerns and stuff so i don't know i'm down for doing a western and they just completely ignore that uh, prompt and i do um sci-fi horror or teenage mutant and so day one picking up the ball Fair play to them. I mean, I, I guess, because I, I was talking to quite a lot of Americans and I, I gather they don't care about Westerns whatsoever. Like how we don't really care about Arthurian legend, but like other people make it. And so you never care about what's in your own back garden, do you? Because like it's in your own back garden. You want like what's on the other side of the fence. I like drawing horses. I wanted to do a Western. And there was a period in like the mid 2000, uh, late 2000s, like with Free Ten to Wyuma, the proposition, um, basically any movie where Warren Ellis and Nick Cave did soundtracks because I really dug them and I really wanted to kind of just delve into that kind of environment and stuff. And yeah, that's essentially it because like um, no one else has let me uh, draw a Western. I'm, I have I had like a little itch that I wanted to scratch. So that's, uh, so yeah, that's why. I mean, you could have even created Cowboys versus Aliens, but that movie was already done. So... I could have done it. If I was a sensible man, that's what I would have done. You know, it's like, you know, clearly Westerns and sci-fi is what uh, uh, tickles uh, John Favreau's uh, pickle. So I could have I could have made thousands and thousands in optioning money. Oh, well. Wow. Wow. The next book after this is a, a noir thing set in the 1960s. So maybe Mark Cherry will do that. And the next one after this, after that one, like a kind of zombie ray type of thing set in a tower block in Elephant Castle. So, you know, maybe Nick Frost or Simon Pegg. Edgar Wright will pick that one up. So, you know, not that I'm so mercenary as to who will pick up and do out my comics before I've drawn them or nothing. I'm, I'm not that I'm much of a capitalist. If you can get Nick Frost, Simon Pegg, and Edgar Wright to do one of your comics, you know, I'd be the first one in front row while watching that film. You won't be able to hear it over me squealing and incandescently with joy. Putting together an anthology yourself because you love these these genres. You love the process of creating, from what I can tell, from what I'm hearing from you here. Are these stories that you've had in the past that you're bringing forth that are maybe unfinished, or are these just brand new stories? Burnt Ends, which is the next one, that is straight up off the top of my dome, original. There are elements of the third one, the Carl Gadar, which has elements of a web comic series that I just literally couldn't get off the ground. But like, it's it's not like I've just re recycled an old idea. And my thing is to do about like maybe seven of these. Like, I have it like a bi-monthly thing. So like in theory, the fourth one, that's going to be the origin story for a character for a longer story that I have on mind. But I tend to find that if I return to the well or older stuff, it just doesn't excite me. And I'm sitting there like, I've, I had one uh, called Here Here. It's a, a, like a little four page comic thing that I've returned to about three or four times. And each time it's been more of an arduous slog than the last. I'm not one for dwelling on past ideas because it just bores a uh, piss out. I mean, I just find it more difficult. Whether it's like the hot newness, I can, I can do that. Because what I did was I got like a cheap notepad and started writing down like pitch ideas. Like I've got about like 20 odd pictures. Some of them are like oh, how I would rehash old ideas and stuff. And then others are like kind of old self cough new ones and stuff. And, and like the ones that are brand new in the book ideas, they're the ones being far more appealing to me and stuff. I'm gearing to do more than like rehashing the old ideas. What's the hardest part about being a creative person when you're trying to create a comic? Is it the beginning, the middle Patience. or the end? Being patient. I mean, in terms of the actual the nuts and bolts of it, it the, the hardest bit of it is drawing the page and coming up with a finish of the page. I can do the thumbnails, I can do the sketching, I can do the inking, I, but it's the final five percent gussying where like, like how am I going to finish this page and present it to the world? Because I'm, I'm learning and what was acceptable to me a year ago, two years ago, six months ago, like a month ago, like, no, I can do better than that. That's just kind of growth as, a, as an artist. More keeping the attention span and the patience. 
like halfway through, like I'm bored of doing this. I want to do the next thing. It was like, well, that doesn't, you know, if I don't do this, there won't be a next thing. So keeping my, my head down and being patient and finishing the product. I have loads of unfinished products that like got just to the final finish line and thought, you know what? I could trip myself up here. So that is the difficult part about creating. The next part, which is fucking tedious and I'm not enjoying it in the fucking slightest, is promoting and pimping and selling and getting my stuff out there. I just want to basically make the book and everyone will come, build it, and they will come. Apparently, that's not how this this works. Like I like the way you set up this uh, this uh, interview thing. Where like a, just fill out a form, and we'll schedule it, and we'll do it that way. There's no ifs, no buts, no candy or nuts about that. Straightforward. But like the other guys, guys, introducing yourself to like other review sites and podcasts, and like like, am I doing this correctly, or am I am I being am I being too informal? I mean, informal enough and stuff. Or am I making myself abundantly clear? As like filling out a form is much easier than like, and then trying to navigate the algorithms of social media because like, obviously, I haven't, I haven't been to any conventions yet and stuff, and. I've been trying to get the logistics of maybe getting in, into shops in the UK, which I don't make any money out of it. It's a pain, and the horror stories I've heard and stuff. Because I'm, like, no, I'm not really, I'm not really willing to basically give you a bunch of stock for you not to. No. If I sell it myself, not to be again mercenary, I make more money from it, so I can then recuperate my costs quicker. So I can then fund the next comic easier. At this level, it is case like it's all going back into the same pot, you know. And if there are any re- uh, retailers out there who are watching this, I've not heard any of horror stories about you. You all seem like wonderful human beings. Especially Gosh. Gosh, you're my local, and they are absolutely delightful. I love them. There's a couple there. Uh, it was probably more than a couple, but the one I usually go to is called Brimstone Games because I play Magic the Gathering. So uh-huh. all of my stuff I read is online these days because of how the show got started. I was reading web comics back in the early 2000s, early late 90s, early 2000s. That's how the show got started. So talking to web comic people, talking to creative people like yourself and those that are brand new to the scene or those that are professionals in the industry, either with the big two or three or whoever they are and it wasn't until i went to comic conventions where i got to see you know that side of the table so to speak when it came to creative people so having this show having the the form having the ability to to bring people on at their leisure to literally say hey you're a creative person come on talk about yourself i know it's difficult because a lot of people uh, find it very difficult to promote themselves and to talk about their work because to be perfectly fair we're we're all introverted <laughs> <laughs> plain and simple that is the hardest thing kind of just being like kind of like i find that once you start getting introverted talking they won't shut the fuck up but like it's getting that initial conversation out of them so like, you know, i've only started getting into reading digitally and, and web tunes and stuff i'm more of like a physical media yeah. kind of cat like i'm trying to because like my comic is digital as well and stuff so just trying to i'm an old man so you know trying to find new ways to do well like I've got webtoon and stuff on my my phone, but like I'd much rather doom scroll through Twitter and waste my time rather than invigorate my soul with, with with media, I guess. I mean, for me, it's I do tapas and and webtoons and one or two others, I think as well too, only because I don't have easy access to a local store and and I still read comics online as well too, so oh. uh, it works out for me. So so the fact that you're you know you're promoting yourself on Twitter, you're promoting your your comic as well too, and you're coming on shows like this is is truly to your benefit. It just it comes back to how how much are you willing to push your creativity and push yourself as a creative person. And you're right. It is very difficult. You, yeah. the algorithms are against you, but to be fair, uh, you're one of the 7 billion people that are a creative person of some way, shape or form. I don't know how this spreads across the board, but like on Twitter, like it's only like 2% of Americans on Twitter. It's a surprisingly small amount of people. And like the amount of people who actually interact to and stuff and like, well, like that's even more dwindling and stuff. They make it sound like it's a, it's a big brouhaha, but it's like, it's a really, all the people on all the planet and all the world, or even all the people in, in the country that you reside in, like the amount of people who just don't, you know, like don't have either social media or whatever. And so like, you know, you, you're again, playing to a smaller group of people and stuff, which is why I want to get into convention stuff. Cause I one I, when I've been to them, I've had a lot of fun and my, day job is retail and um, I work in an off license chatting shit about whiskey for five whole minutes is really fun 
they're telling people like the old just stories behind like why this bottle of vodka is called uh, heavy water the gift of the gab is is quite a lot of fun to engage in and stuff which you can't really do on twitter because like you know only what 280 le- letters and stuff and that's not enough time to be nuanced funny or get your point across it comes back to how you interact with people sometimes if you find the the limits of a social media you find yourself to be a little more creative in in how you word things and how you promote and how you how you push and um, sometimes you can be funny sometimes you can be straight to the point and you have five seconds for it to appear in front of someone and even that sometimes isn't enough you know you have the gift of gab in your job can you turn that to the promotion of your comic itself or or how have you I'm trying. To. I, I, um, I'm as I'm on on your show as well. As I'm I'm trying to be on as many podcasts as I can because I I know when uh, I've uh, watched uh, people on podcasts and stuff. I've then gone and checked their stuff out, especially if they seemed interesting and stuff. Um, like I, I bought that big tome of Bone because uh, Jeff Bone was on um uh, on off panel or something like that. And so it's like he, he came across as such an, an interesting and everything about it came across such. He talked me into it. I was like, you yeah. know, I think that's how I came across Merrick, the uh, Elephant Man, because maybe Tom was on a um, uh, on a podcast. Cuddles, I think I came across it that way. Like, there's loads of small little indie producers and stuff that I've I've come across while listening to them on various podcasts and stuff. Because like, you know, hearing people talk works wonders. If someone's passionate about it and stuff, you can go, oh, I'll go down. I'm down for that. Or if they're interesting, getting to know someone covers a multitude of sins that you would just kind of maybe like if you didn't know that person and you didn't know anything about them you wouldn't be able to willing to overlook say for example like the art style isn't necessarily jumping out to you or the story is a bit kind of wishy-washy or anything else if you heard the person talk you know well i can look past that you know to a certain degree in non-podcasty terms i did it with frank miller and stuff because i when i first opened up family values that one um i really wasn't feeling his art it's like, well, I've heard lots of good things, so I'll give it a go. And like now he's like one of the formative artists in my in, in you know, back when I was when I was a kid and everything. And just getting to know the person and getting to you know, like hear and instead of going into it cold, like a bit of a primer, you know. In terms of people that look at your comic online and, and how you've been sharing it through social media and all that other stuff there, what have been some of the the responses to what you've been creating? The only positive. Like most people seem to dig what I do. I've uh, I've been really lucky in the fact that like since I started again, no one said anything negative about anything I've done. I mean, I don't know. That means they've if there is something negative, no one's bothered to say it or nothing like that. Or I'm putting myself certain avenues that it's like, oh, I'm being critical because like I remember back in the day I was on um on Pencil Jam and I'd post my artwork there like and and it was shite and there would be lots of kind of critical things about it and it's like you know i don't need this noise i did listen to what they said and now that i'm an older man with thicker skin and could could take the criticism and go ah oh, yes you're right that needs to happen this needs to happen that's you know uh, i'm not getting any of that so like either a i'm the greatest artist that's ever happened to be on god's green planet or like there's nothing to critique about my artwork or not people who would have a critique don't have a big enough critique to make think i can't bother to type that you know i wouldn't like to know where i fucked up or where i'm shit just so i can improve my artwork but apparently it's perfect so i have to rely on myself to realize how i'm uh, making a complete balls of it before uh, you get any <laughs> better improvements i guess how is music and being in the various industries that you are in retail and being in a band and being a creative person how has that influenced your your art and your style inspired me because i didn't i don't want to do retail no more and i was in a hardcore punk band so maybe the uh hardcore punk elements kind of filter into the slightly sketchy uh grittier kind of style of the artwork but i was in a band called bear versus rhino there's three of us two of my best friends being in a band is like herding cats and if you're not a manager or you don't have a manager if you're doing it yourself you're the lead person if you can go from like okay cool i've written these songs You've rehearsed these songs. We've played these songs live. We know these songs. You and me and him, the drummer, are going to go here and we're going to record and then he's going to mix and then we're going to have a CD out that we can then release and stuff. I'm going to do a music video for that. If you can do all of that and just get it over the finishing line, then you can sit yourself down, 
spend two weeks writing and doing post-production on a comic and then draw the fucking thing. Being in a band is a bigger ball ache than creating comics. Because also, making a comic, the barrier and the litmus and quality control is lower. You see loads of stuff. It's like, that gets lots of reviews and positive things. Thinking that's that's just above amateur pro, you know? This, this isn't the same necessarily amateur hour, but it's, it's not necessarily like, what um, say, Marvel or DC or Image would publish or nothing like that. But it's out there and people are buying it and stuff and people are digging it. Whereas with being in a band, if you don't dig the singer, which I had a really unique voice, if the sound mix is bad or whatever, like there's loads more various guys like, yeah, no, you, that is shit. We ain't fucking around with that stuff. Uh, Whereas like, Certainly tough on my, my skin. Went for the uh, arsehole of trying to play gigs in London, which is like, Christ. Putting all that passion, all that fire, and all that energy in just to have it just fizzle out. You either A, quit, which I did. I, I did quit making music. The reason I quit music was not because the band wasn't any good. If luck had been on our side and we'd continued playing and stuff, we'd have polished ourselves to a good enough state, but like, just, that wasn't on the cards and stuff. And then so Bear vs. Wild broke up. Just trying to start again, I was like, no, I can't. I, I literally can't. This is, you don't have the energy. Whereas, like, doing the comics and stuff, I've made the comic. It is eternal. I don't need other, uh, two other cats to come along with me and promote it and sell it and stuff. It's forever there. And I think, in a lot of ways, like, any criticism of it, it'd be much easier to take. Being in a band is a fucking arsehole. Making comics is easier. Everyone should make comics. That's a great segue. I love that. That's perfect. <laughs> If you're going into the 60s or, or anything like that, you're going more in film noir. I, th- I think shadowing would be a, a benefit, like how light plays on, on surfaces. Um, I think that was something that was missed a little bit in, in the story that I read here. Yeah, you're right. I, I, that is one of the things I noticed about it too. Uh, you know Jeff Dower, right? Uh, comic book artist is Shaolin Cowboy and all the Matrix. Saying like how he doesn't like using black. It feels like it's it, erasing the image and stuff. If I have a fault, using black isn't really my sh- my strong point. And shading and coloring, it's you're right. Light, shade, and tone. I'm a penciler and an inker, and that kind of thing to me is more like a painterly kind of mindset. Mm. And like you're destroying what you've drawn when you've painted it. And painting essentially, you take a color and then you cut and you scrape and you add. And it's it's a different mindset to like kind of sitting there drawing and stuff. But you are right. You're 100 percent right. And for burnt ends, I'm making a deliberate effort. Like it's a concerted effort to make uh, to have the um, palette and colors I have uh, include massive bits of black, massive bits of white. And I think it's just trying to find the appropriate mid tones. I can get my noggin around like this is black, this is white, mid tones. I totally agree with that. I am working on that with burnt ends, which well, when you get to see it, hopefully you'll be ah, oh, he improved himself. You know, so it's just like yeah. I mean, the reason why this is uh, black and white is because, one, my intention was to colour it. Halfway through the book, I realised I have not put any thought into what I would do to colour this book since I had the initial idea. And I, I'm really not in the fucking mood to do it and stuff. And then, like, there's the um, the cost difference. Mm. It's quite a bit, you know. And there's kind of things you need to take into consideration. Like, this is either a, a three-quid book, it's a reasonable return, or it's... Like, it's a three-quid book where it's not so much of a reasonable turn. And, like, this is, like, this the third thing that I've ever lettered. And I never bothered lettering before because, like, my handwriting is appalling. If I'm bad at handwriting, I'm going to be bad at lettering. And then a couple of things back were, like, they said, like, oh, you need to letter this. Like, okay, fine, I'll, I'll give it a go. And, like, oh, I really dig this. I actually quite enjoy lettering and stuff. So, like, so, but I thought, well, if I'm going to do this. And, like, bad lettering will stand out a lot more especially if it's on top of bad colouring. If I can focus on one new talent and I don't have to worry so much about like the other talents, not to get it, uh, into uh, inside a baseball, but like one thing, colour theory, I don't know it well enough to kind of choose the tones and stuff. And I use Clip Studio and they don't have a proper colour wheel. Whatever theory you got for Photoshop doesn't apply to Clip, Clip Studio and stuff. And it's like, mm-hmm. like CMKY, like the idea that I would do this entire book and get it back, and all the colors would just be wrong. So here's another thing to fuck around with was like gray, black, and white look the same no matter what. I mean, I have colored some comics, but it's not really something that I enjoy so much that I would think, oh, I need to do this. Whereas like lettering, I really enjoy and stuff. So that's the reason why it's black and white. 
<laughs> and it makes perfect sense. Cost effectiveness of creating comics. You're, you're not the first and you won't be the last to create black and white comics. And sometimes the, the black and white comics actually are better than something that's been colored because maybe the, the color when it was printed didn't work out well. Maybe it was because some conversion didn't happen correctly or whatever the situation is. Like there's certain coloring techniques that I just can't be fucking with. And like, if it's on, I was like, uh, I see what you've done there. And I know why you did it, but I know. Like, but like, if someone's colored it and stuff, I don't want to be like, yo, you did this and stuff. I don't like that. It's like my tattoos and stuff, right? I hired a tattoo artist to do these. They're not my designs. Cool, what do you want to do? And if I'm going to hire a colorist, it'd be pretty much in the same vein. And I don't want to be like, yo, do this. Uh, and then they come back with something that, isn't to my liking because I don't want to micromanage because like that's not the point of having the colorist and you know they're there to add that because I if I could color it I would but my palette would be like well I want basically want like flat Dave Stewart uh color and stuff which is like you can do that but like make it look like sound like everyone else so it's like in theory if I was to do it I would hire somebody who would give it its own flair and stuff mm -hmm. and then to micromanage that would just be like another like you know and which I know I would do and I know it would like every little fault in it would bug the crap out of me and I you know so while I'm doing this on my own, I don't want to have that burden on myself. It's a terrible trait to have as a human being, and I realize I have it, so that I'm not going to prod it and stuff. If, say, like a publisher or whatever picks me up and gives me the draw and stuff, then they can deal with the colorist. Then I've done my part of it and stuff. If you're happy with it, that's kind of what's important about it. And if I'm really, really, really being a prick about it and I'm happy about it, I could just do what Brian Boland did and just recolor it like uh, 30 years later. They get Mark Hamill to make a, a return to a really bad animated movie. You know, my favorite uh, Mark Hamill joke a bit was is in uh, Batman Returns, the movie. Mm -hmm. uh, what secrets he's uh, had, secrets that are mine alone to know. And it's like, fuck me, Hamill, you are good. <laughs> I was just like chills. And like, I, like, I mean, the the, anime, the Batman Beyond was my favorite Batman. So yeah. I just like to have him and it's like, oh, ooh. It's just, yeah, that just, that's. Yeah, the, the uncensored version of that film was, was really well done. I mean, even the censored version was was still pretty good. Like, I can see why they took the stuff out of it. You know, it's it's nice that we have two two versions of it. You know, what you know, it's not like it, not like it completely muted it. You know, it's not. Like, when was the first time you learned that language had power? I think when I first made someone laugh. You know, that that visceral thing where like you make someone who isn't necessarily your family just laugh and like, oh, then he realizes value in the entertainment of and getting that out of people. Yeah. I think what kind of cemented that as well was like, because I come from a creative household. My dad's uh, a writer and stuff, and uh, he gets immense joy out of it. And my uh, grandma used to play like pianos in um in like old pubs and stuff. He was a professional musician in and around like uh, local Cambridge scene and stuff. So I think hearing people laugh at what I've said that was funny, seeing the, the power and the joy that my uh, my dad and my grand got out of it and stuff. So, you know, it's like, oh, there's a lot, lot to be there. And, and then when you... You start experiencing media yourself, and you realize that the effect it's having on you, and it kind of compiles like uh, like X Men the animated series, just like that big old drama of just like kind of melodrama, just like kind of really just hits you there, and it's like yeah, you can see. Yeah, you know. I think young would probably be the answer to that question, and then just kind of blossom from there, and then like it just comes like a a part of your everyday kind of life when you realize that you know because like the, the words are there to communicate and stuff because like, there's loads of things you can say that just like well either a make someone laugh or make someone bored or make someone angry or you know offend them to their very core and stuff and if you know what you're doing and what you're saying and how you're doing it and if you're intentional with it you can weigh your power over people provided that they take the bite and everything so yeah it's just what is one mistake that you'll never do again that's a good fucking question uh, in terms of creativity and working with people and stuff, realizing when someone is not necessarily stringing me along, but not coming in on their end, and for whatever reason, not maliciously and stuff, uh, are not in committed to it and not giving it their all. And there's this, you know, seeing that sign and then uh, not cutting that person loose because essentially you, you're just wasting your time. And their time by hoping that somehow they'll pull their thumb out their ass and get on board of you and get to everything. It's like quite a lot of the time, it's not, it's not a malicious thing that they're, that, that, that they're doing it for. That's, I, I'm not scamming. I'm not being a troll. I made a commitment that I cannot follow through on. And just like, being in a band kind of taught that, like, because at least hoping that someone will, like, will basically do what they said they will do, noticing 
that they're not doing it and that they won't do it and holding up for hope that they will somehow change their ways because you're being passive aggressive towards them and stuff, you know? So yeah, I think in terms of professionalism and artwork and stuff, that's the thing I'm gonna learn. In terms of other mistakes I've made in my in my life, uh, well, they're too embarrassing to put on a podcast. So I'm not gonna fucking say it. What in life is beautiful to you? All of it, really. Well, obviously, you, you've seen my wife and my daughter. They were exceptionally beautiful to me. I adore London as a as a city. I adore it in the snow. You know, when you've got like a crisp night and there's a the moon bright in the sky and it's got a, a halo around it. I really adore that. And I think in terms of like kind of like artistic beauty. I think the most beautiful thing I've ever seen is uh, in Texas Chainsaw Massacre. They're in the van and their mates running behind them and there's a big blue Texas sky. That's just stuck with me since forever. So I think that would be, in terms of like kind of, yeah, big blue Texas skies would be uh, something I'd consider very beautiful. Not having never been to Texas, can't wait to go there and see if it's as much as I, uh, as I dream it to be. What is the wisest thing someone has ever said to you that has stuck with you in your career? Paraphrasing. It's a, it's a thing that's filtered through quite a lot. It's, shut the fuck up and get, get out uh, your own way. And two, Paul McCartney ne- and the Beatles never worked for free. You should never work for free. Like you should always get something uh, for your time and your effort because it's you're working, right? So you should be rewarded for it, right? Yeah, never work for free would be a uh, would be a, a thing that I would put out to the world. I've heard it on this on the old YouTube where people uh, like like one guy was interviewing like a, it was like a trust fund baby and like his dad gave him five million pounds. You know, you know what you are. It's, you should work for free. It's like, you're a fucking millionaire, fam. You can pay me to do this. Why am I working for free to, to do your pet project and stuff, to do your hobby for you? No, no, no. If there's work to be done, there's work to be paid. And another YouTube thing on here uh, I saw was like, well, basically a guy uh, saying like, um, saying that like, how you set up a schedule to, to for your work and stuff and everything. Oh, and by the way, you might have to work on, on the weekend for, uh, for free, even though your uh, employers have told you not to do that, which means it's you are breaking your contract with your employers, which I think is a pretty dangerous and shitty bit of advice to put out there. He's part of a, a group of people who aren't very nice and don't uh, have good business values. But yeah, like don't work for free. Don't break your contract. Do the work that you pay to do or, you know, and don't do it for free. That is there anything that I haven't touched upon that you'd like to showcase those that are watching and listening to this interview? Oh, other than the fact that like um, my commissions are open and stuff. So if you want me to draw you something, I'm available to do that. Well, you can either go, uh, contact me via Twitter or uh, email me at marcuspattendraws at gmail.com. If you go to my Patreon site, there is a pinned post that uh, breaks down my, uh, my commissions and stuff. I'm very reasonable and I'm very good. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Uh, on a sentimental note, uh, my dad, he's been writing books since I've been alive and stuff. And like, he gets an immense amount of joy out of it and stuff. And it's like, yeah, he can do it. I can do it. So, yeah. And then obviously the second person would be my grand in the, uh, in the fact that she made a career out of artistic endeavors as well. So, you know, because essentially the, the, the main inspiration for me at the moment, is my wife and my daughter, because like, essentially I don't want to come across as a pathetic loser in their eyes so i need to achieve something and at some point i don't want to work in uh, in an office anymore because it cripples my back so i'd like to be paid to draw comics so like and put food on their table their need for heating and food and rent you know i suppose my landlord would also be a pretty big inspiration just, uh, uh, for just getting stuff done because i do enjoy this i do enjoy making comics stuff but at some point i need to transition from a uh from like it being like a, a, a like a hobby to like a, an actual profession and stuff. So yeah, they're, they're my main inspirations because one, don't want to look like a, a like a complete wanker in front of them, and two, I need to provide for them and stuff. You know, from a professional perspective, you are creating comics for yourself and for those that would love to read them. And of course, you're on the show here to promote yourself too, which is always a a fun time, hopefully had by all. And you are creating comics. You're creating an anthology series. You've created other comics in the past as well too. You've been in a band, so you've been successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? No. I mean, no. I mean, 
I mean, I mean, no. I'm a, I mean, other than the fact that like I get out of bed every day and the rest is noise, like no, not not even a little. What do you think stops that? I whatever arbitrary um line that would classify it as a success. I haven't, I haven't achieved it. I uh, maybe I need to define it for myself, but at the moment. Yeah, I'm creating everything for myself and everything, but like, I mean, I suppose it's weird because like, no one's actually come along and say, hey, can you do this for me? So there's like, no one has instigated any sort of like uh, faith in me to put the money where my mouth is. That's unsuccessful, you know? You know, not to put it on, to, like I'm, I need to have a Netflix deal to be uh, successful, but the idea that someone took what I made and thought, you know what, I can exploit that I can make money out of that. There is success in that as well. I don't have to go back to an off license to work, or I don't have to go back to retail. I don't have to work in the doldrums, lower working class to make money and stuff. There's no success in that, you know. Chris Evans, the ginger one, not the cool one, said that basically his level of success was he would go into a a restaurant and he would have to look at the price, just order whatever, whatever he wanted. He had money to pay for it. Now, I realize as a comic book artist, I'm never going to be that, and I don't intend on marrying a PB Best and fucking Billy Piper, but the idea that I am somehow comfortable while making comics, that would be what I would classify as successful. I don't need to be super duper rich. I don't need the next Netflix deal, though it would be nice. I don't need my books to be optioned, though it would be nice to get 100,000 a year, whatever, just to keep it in limbo so someone else doesn't make it. You know, like, all these things would be nice. But basically, I just want to provide for my wife and my family and pay for my rent and everything and just not have to go back to retail. And at the moment, I work I worked two days a week in retail, so I'm not a success. Talk to me again at the end of the year. I might have a different answer to that. Probably not. I'm a gloomy fucker, so probably not know. <laughs> as long as you can find your path to happiness, that's the main thing. And you have a family, and that's that's even better that you have people to support you and people to guide you in your life as well, too. And you have a, a focal point that you can focus yeah. your creativity on. That's, you know, some of us don't have that. And those that those that do, like yourself, you know, you're better for it in the world and yourself as a person. So that's a good thing. I, it is a good thing. I, I agree with that. That's, a, that, that's a, yeah, that's very well done. You've said that far more succinctly than I could have. I don't have less swearing, so congratulations. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Learn from them and move on. There's a lot to be learned from. Like, as I was saying, like the in the mistake thing, like waiting for that, that guy to turn up to rehearsals. You know, waiting for like um like your collaborator to rock up and when they don't and like you know and also one thing I think this is I've learned that this is not any advice I've ever received but something I've picked up on if you rely on the favors and the kindness of strangers you'll get fucking nowhere whereas if you go hey I've got a contract with you here's some money I want you to do this you've got a mo- lot more leverage and like and well you know if you don't mind you know. I know you're doing me a flavor here, but like if you could, you know, it's like you go like, actually, no, I've told you to do this. You know, we have we have got a contract, we've got an accord. If you don't do this, you're letting me down, right? I think that's uh, how I've learned from failures. But like one, to never rely on other people for the uh, out of kindness and generosity of their hearts, because that's the thing. They they are being kind and they're being generous, but like unless, but if they don't do it to your satisfaction or they don't do it quickly enough, then you don't really have a, you know, if you pester them, then you're a dickhead who's pestering someone who's doing you a favor. Whereas, like, if you have, like, actually, you know, this is, like, I've paid you to do this, or I'm telling you to do this, or we've got a, a, a contract. It's not your mate doing you a favor. It's a colleague doing you their job. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way. And the fact that you have the younger generation with you and they're looking at your work and they're seeing what you're creating, they may become creative in their own way, whether it's as an artist, a writer, a musician, whatever they would like to be creative. In. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Just make really bad art and then the generation after that will have to improve upon it. I'm sorry. I've been doing this for 13 years. I've never heard that answer. 
<laughs> I mean, that's, I mean, it's true, isn't it? Like you know, like you know, I mean, as as much as we all uh, love Jack Kirby and stuff, like if Joe Mayer is an inherently better artist. You know, and David Ahar is an inherently better artist than Joe Mattiello, you know, and then, you know, and then whoever gets inspired by uh, those three cats will be inherently better than than those three cats that came before them. Like, you know, not that there is no value in in their work, you know. I shouldn't have said Jack Kirby, because Jack Kirby's actually really good. I should have said, uh, oh, he's fucking dying. Thanks for um, Mark Bagley is shit. I don't like his artwork. And so therefore, like, um, the generation that came after him is inherently better. Like, you know, like Humberto Ramos, John Madiola, um, Billy Tan, and, like, the image cats and top cow cats, you know, came after. You know, their, their artwork is, is, is much better. But is that so, because the no, styles I, have improved? Or is that because, I, you know... I think it's just a personal preference. I just can't... It, there's... A, you know, there's that star that's in seems to be inspired by George Perez and stuff and Mark Bagley and that. And it's just it's just something about it just does not sit right with me. So I'm I might be an overly harsh on Mark Bagley, who from what I can gather is a really cool cat who, who basically you give him a job and he would do it. So like I'm I shouldn't be chatting shit about him. I'm sure he's you know it's, I'm, I realize that this time it's just personal preference and stuff. And in fairness, he's a, a highly successful Marvel artist, so it doesn't matter what I can't say. Like you know, but also actually choose a. An artist who generally is terrible, then like you know, like you know, what benefit does that to, uh, to anybody really? And so like you know, he can take the he can take the slight uh, ding to his person is a uh, ego, I guess. If he ever watches, so and finds out who the fuck I am, you know. No, it's obviously the fact that Joe Madiero is inherently better. Uh, Joe yeah, Madiero is the greatest yeah. artist of all time. The possible exception of uh, Joel Jones. About the creative people in, in general throughout the centuries, like the the fine artists type deal, you know when. Picasso was doing his stuff, you know, someone else came up to say, well, I, that's shit. I can do better than Picasso. <laughs> I mean, that's, you know, it's uh, like we are uh, talking about um, uh, Watchmen and stuff like, yeah. um, like obviously Adam Moore, uh, like Steve Ditko, but he doesn't agree with anything he says. So, well, this is how I can improve upon that and stuff. And he came out with a totally different point of view and like greatest bit of uh, comic book literature that ever was. And, you know, shame we didn't get to complete it, but then, and you get uh, Zack Snyder's version in which he goes like, you know what, I I like what you did. I disagree with your point of view. So this is how I think it should go. And then you go, oh, okay. So like, you know, and there's an uh, argument to be made, which is better and stuff. I mean, a lot of people say like it's, uh, it is the comics originally, but like I, I came to the film first. So I enjoyed the film a lot. Um, and I enjoyed the comics not as much because like, because um, I didn't uh, read the comics with my wife in a uh, cinema in Bristol while we're having a lovely holiday together. So, you know, then the um, TV series came along and said, you know what? I've seen what you've done and I can improve upon that, you know. But that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I do greatly appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I had a a guest. Where can we find you? How can we support you on social media? And of course, where can we find 13 Shots of Whiskey? I mainly live on Twitter at the moment. Uh, so, uh, uh, I'm NJX07 on Twitter. Uh, the Kofi link at the bottom is where I post um, basically blog updates about the uh, about the making of uh, uh, of the three, uh, 13 Shots um, patrons, or so you can find me. Um, yeah, basically, I'm on I'm on Twitter, I'm on Kofi, and I'm on Patreon. I might be getting on to... Um, trying to get back into youtube but like yeah I find it exhausting uh if you want to buy the physical copy of this for three pounds plus delivery charge because i'm sorry uh if you go to my etsy store that's uh you know etsy stores that's sc shop uh, marcus Patton, you can get the physical copy of this uh if you go to my uh gum road uh you can get uh, the digital copy for two pounds or if you're in london and you feel like coming down to soho I work at Jerry's Wines and Spirits, uh, Saint for Compton Street on Fridays. I'm off Sundays because basically I'm, I need to take holiday. But like, yeah, basically, if you want to pick it up in store from me in person, and I'll sign it for you. So yeah, and also I do uh, I do commissions and stuff, and I got prints at the Etsy store as well. So like, if you want me to draw you anything, um, it's Marcus Patton draws at gmail.com, and we can uh, have a natter about that. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, 
tgtmedia.com or two geeks talking.com that's the word two not the number two our youtube channel which is a little more updated than our website because i'm only one person as well i i do all the technology stuff is youtube.com forward slash tgt media and as i say every week everyone has a story to tell it's up to me to help bring that out thanks for listening watching on two geeks talking